I, I missed the opening today, so I don't know how many times people have said thank you to Spencer. So I'd like to say thank you to Spencer for hosting and for having Click, one of the few programmes I still watch on the BBC. They got rid of Dateline, they got rid of Mark Como, but we still have you. So, for the, well, um, if there are BBC people here, it, the future is there. So give more money to his, his budget. Um, which is one of the reasons why I'm here too. Um, small scale DAB in Bristol, UK, but it's not just Bristol, it's across the country, it's across the world. Um, my partner, Nick Piggott, who I know a lot of you do know, is usually here, and he usually does the, I'm here to tell you about the uh, why of, of what we do, what we do. Nick is the one who tells us how. He's the tech guy, and he's not here, so he's probably somewhere now listening on his phone, and fixing somebody's uh, something for, for a radio station somewhere in the world on his laptop at the same time while on holiday. If there are gaps in what I say, um, as someone said earlier on, you can contact Nick, Nick Piggott, and you can contact him and ask him any questions that you like. He, I'm sure he'll be willing to answer them. Uh, he's that kind of a guy. Um, we've been asked to share with you how community radio stations in Bristol, in the west of England, have collaborated to win and build small-scale digital multiplexes as a business that returns profits to the community radio sector. Um, let's get going. So I'll give you a little bit of our history. Um, to explain the story of small-scale DAB in the UK and our plans in Bristol, it probably does help to have some history and context. This is a new cross. Um, Nick chose this picture not knowing that in a different life, when I was a poacher, not a gamekeeper, I probably would have been up one of those towers putting up pirate radio poles, as we called them. Um, this is from, yes, from New Cross, and I'm sure that Nick, in a different life, has probably been on at least one of those towers. Um, so list of pirate stations back in the day. Uh, in the 70s, and between the 70s and the 90s, uh, there was only one commercial music radio station in the UK, and two popular music stations from the BBC. Uh, that, but there was a vast array of pirate stations, uh, as you can see. 90.2, Rock to Rock, is a station that I joined when I left university. Uh, I didn't call it a pirate, it was just a radio station. I didn't even know what it meant to be a pirate. Uh, but I'm in Bristol now, so I've got a better idea. <laughs> this, this vast array of pirates got themselves on the air by not following the rules. What they had to do, um, in good and bad ways, I should say, pirate radio is not, uh, pirate radio stations are not forms of Robin Hood. Um, it's, not, it's not all good, but most of the pirate radio people that I've ever met are just people that love music and want to share it and found ways to get on air. Uh, going up to the top of a tower block, uh, getting keys, putting up a mast, and off they went. Um, uh, Nick gave me a joke here, it says ju they just had to knock on doors and maybe copy a few keys to make it happen. Uh, we had lots of support, lots of people would support us. Nowadays, these are community radio stations. Community radio stations were, were kind of, I guess, as a response from the radio authority at the time, now Ofcom, to, to clamp down on pirates, get these other stations through. Well, I come from... The group that I was involved with actually managed to get a commercial license. We were the second group after uh, KISS to actually turn from pirate into licensed. Uh, that station doesn't exist anymore. Uh, a bigger fish came along and then another bigger fish and another bigger fish. Um, we, were, we were in New Cross and Deptford and the station that finally closed down was playing country and pop music to the people of New Cross and Deptford. If you don't know New Cross and Deptford, uh, but you may have known Only Fools and Horses or Desmond's. It's not a country music and pop area. Um, it just isn't. We exist because the people in our areas, the communities in which we live, want to hear something that they do not hear on mainstream. And as, as you can see, uh, we are now, there are more community radio stations across the UK than there are local BBC stations. And even though the growth of community radio has slowed down, uh, partly because of FM spectrum, I can guarantee you that over time the amount of community radio stations there are will probably become more than commercial stations because communities are that varied right across the UK and that, that niche. 
more and more will come. Uh, what I should have said at the beginning of this is that this approach, our approach, isn't uh, a rival to the BBC. We're not a rival to the commercial sector. We love and respect them both. We learn from both. Half of our people, more than half of our people, are ex-commercial or ex-BBC. And they come to us because they want to try something different. They want to try something innovative. And we would not exist without them. So to all of those that are here, you know, thank you. We have what we call, I guess, a do-it-yourself approach. Actually, I keep looking up there, and I'm, it's there. <laughs> uh, it applied to building our own transmitters at the time, as I said, and uh, an ecosystem was created of people that built transmitters, built aerials, at very, very, very low cost. Um, and that principle is what, in a sense, has moved into community radio now, and will continue, because we can't play with the big boys. We just, it's just you know, unfathomable for us. We could not. Um, I remember being part of the uh, original meeting held at Hof Ofcom to talk about small-scale DAB and um, how to make it work and the trial and the experiments. It's with the help of credible people like yourselves, innovative people, some may even say nerdy people, um, that have really pushed the boundaries and allowed, firstly, pirate radio, but now community radio, and now small-scale DAB to exist at a price, at a cost, in a way that we can actually afford. Just to say also, uh, a lot of those transmitters are still on tower blocks, um, and some of those pirates are still up there because they still are not being representative, represented within the media. I will never use the term MSM. <laughs> so just a little bit more about... Who, well, that's, this is one of Nick's things. And, and I don't presume to tell you guys about the decline of analog radio because you've heard other people talk about it. Um, but I don't think community radio's declining because during the, uh, the lockdown, we actually proved how valuable and important that we were. And that our sector, our station in Bristol, um, was designated a, a key service, which allowed me to go outside my house in the daytime, which is always pleasant. <laughs> the launch of... The, I'm, I'm just going to let that speak for itself. I don't need to speak to that. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about Hujima Radio. We came out of... Uh, a radio training project. The idea was we wanted to provide a service to young people who were not represented within mainstream media. And then it became people not represented within mainstream media. We were looking for pipelines to get people aware of how the media works, what it does, um, and where we take it. These, these slides have nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but they are slides that the technical people will appreciate much more. <laughs> What, what we did was originally go for a, 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 an access radio license, and then that became a community radio license. The point of what we do is to make people more aware, more familiar of how the media works, and to break down the mystery and the barriers, and for a lot of people, get them jobs, because that was one of the reasons they came to us. They want, they want to work. Uh, they want to be involved. They want to contribute. They want to make a difference, and that's what we've tried to help them do. Um, we've been a licensed station since 2008, I think, um, or we've been in action since 2008. We've been a licensed station now for 14 years, I think. Um, and over the years, we have probably trained around 1,500 people. We probably train about 100 people a year. Um, some go into the industry, some stay with us, some go off to do other things and then come back to the industry. This is beautiful Bristol. I don't know why Nick put that one there. This is actually not the picture that's in my system. So what it is, we have two licenses, one for East Bristol and one for, let's call it West Bristol. It's divided into two. Three community radio stations came together for the first time ever and applied for these two licenses. And through some um, strategic thinking, we've managed to win both those licenses. So we've gone up from broadcasting to around 100,000 people each to a collective of five, a potential of 500,000 people. 
we own the multiplex, and then we uh, have reached out to other community radio stations uh, in our area and offered them the, the CDSP rate, a cheaper rate for the community stations, and then other more commercial stations have come on and paid a more expensive rate. They're, they're happy to pay it. It's still really, really cheap. Um, I think the equivalent for us, the community stations, is at roughly £50 per station per month. So it's, it's comparable to what some people would do on the internet, pay on the internet to have their stations. Uh, that's a real, oh, there you go. You didn't tell me you'd done that. So the three stations are Ajima Radio, which is a station that I work with, um, Bristol Community FM, BCFM, and Bradley Stoke Radio. So you can see we are, we're actually based in St Paul's, BCFM is based in Eastern, Bradley Stoke Radio is in Bradley Stoke, but we control the small scale DAB multiplex for the city of Bristol. There you go, Seven Side and Bristol Digital. Nick, I don't know what you've done. It's not Spectrum. There you go. Um, when, when Ofcom offered these small-scale DABs, uh, the, the, prob the, the, the issue for us was how do we, how, can we afford it? So it's when we used what, I, what Nick would call the pirate radio mentality. How do we... How do we do this? Because the prices, the costs of the equipment that's out there. Just yesterday I was talking to Nick and he's told me that someone from Ofcom wanted to, had to come along and do a, uh, verify our work and it was going to cost us £2,000. There's no economy of scale for us, for our sector. Now, for some of the bigger players, £2,000 is not a big deal. But then, because of the wind and the rain, that person was going to have to leave and come back another day, which would have cost us another £2,000, which probably would have turned our operation into loss-making in the year one. Um, fortunately, um, those... I'm going to call them nerds because I love them, and I mean it out of love. That nerd stayed with Nick on top of a roof in the wind and the rain that's been around for the last couple of days to get the job done. And that's our attitude. We get the job done. Uh, and we do it not, to, not specifically to save costs, but costs is, the end, is, is, is it. So for us, the spectrum has a, has a value. And what that value now goes to community radio, not to anybody else. We are all not-for-profit, so all of our profits go back into the community. It might buy some new equipment. It may pay for someone to be employed. It may pay for a uh, tea and coffee for our volunteers. What's, I think, crucial for us, and this said, it's, it's all about the local. It's all about the local. It's all about being connected. It's all about... So we are going to be um, launching officially on the 28th of this month. We're inviting the local MP, the local councillors, the mayor, blah, 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 all lovely, wonderful people. But that's because they are part of our community too. So there will be businesses there. There will be organisations there. We are not exclusive. We are inclusive and it's really important that that emanates from everything that we say and everything that we do. So this, uh, at the last time we presented, this was the first slide. So that shows what a traditional aerial looks like. That's one in Bristol during the uh, balloon fiesta that we are famous for down there. But these are the sites where we've been using. Um, so on top of the University of West, Western England, on top of a tower block, a bit like the Pirates, a small shopping centre, a bank, um, wherever, you can, wherever we can get them. And uh, appropriate technology, which is Nick's bit. Uh, basically, you guys read that, and I'm going to talk about something else. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I know what that is, because I've got one, but, you know. Um, <laughs> In order for us to win our licenses, we had to win the hearts and minds. And that's what I meant about we, had to reach, we have to reach out to everyone. We have to be inclusive. We cannot be exclusive. We have to make people understand that all we're trying to do is reach those parts of the community, oh, it sounds like an advert, that others cannot reach. And we do that on an everyday basis because that's what we do as community radio stations. As I said, during the pandemic, we proved our worth, if you like. Um, I don't know if that's going to make anything. Oh, this is a bit that is interesting to some people because it's about the money. Um, I, I can't, well, he's, he's got the, the other radio stations pay 8,400, local stations 2,000, the community radio stations, literally, uh, the three main owners of the stations, we pay a pound. Um, I don't know if anyone's got comparable figures for their stations, but I think we're cheapest. 
Uh, uh. <laughs> Sorry, I, these are Nick's bits, not mine. Um, so I think I'm just, I'm just going to try and sum up. Um, as I said, for us, having control of the spectrum was important because we can then provide more services that are appropriate to our committee. We're not gatekeepers. We're not trying to keep people out. We're trying to uh, improve, extend what it is that is on, available to our, to our people. I've listened to a few people talk today and there's some wonderful things being said about re reaching out and having other people involved. Well. I'm going to give this quick example. Um, there is a, no, I'm not going to give an example, but there is a whole world of people that are not involved in DAB or DAB+. A lot of them listen to stations like ours. They will become involved in DAB+, because they will follow people like us. They will follow the content that we provide. Um, I've heard many people talk. Um, metadata is fascinating, but I always believe that content is king. And if they like our station and we move on to DAB, they will want to follow us because they like our station. Um, they will not go on the, on the DAB to listen to a station that they don't like, regardless of what is in their car or in their home. They just won't do it. Um, the existence of pirates and now the proliferation of community radio stations, I think, is proof of that. More costs, more costs. <laughs> These slides are available for Nick, from Nick if you wish. So as this says, it's not just about getting more digital radio on air and giving more stations the chance. It's about, I'll, I'll read it, it's about flexing innovation and using different thinking to overturn the old expectations of digital radio and to prove that it be, can be done in a fundamentally different way. Um, that's me, that's that. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.